Colgate University. For videos, podcasts, and other digital resources, visit colgate.edu slash colgateconversations. The following interview is one of a series of Colgate Conversations on World Affairs, hosted by Colgate University President Jeffrey Herbst. Welcome to today's conversation on world affairs. I'm Jeffrey Herbst, president of Colgate University, and with me in the studio is Professor Michael Watts, professor in class of 1963 chair of geography at the University of California, Berkeley. Michael is the author and editor of numerous books and articles based on his long-term research in Nigeria. In 2001, he was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship for his work on the impact of oil in Africa. Michael, welcome to Colgate. Jeff, thanks very much for the invitation. You've had one of the longest and sustained records of research on Nigeria, Africa's most populous country, a major oil exporter to the United States, and a country which is absolutely critical to the future of West Africa. It's had its share of problems, but also significant accomplishments in the last few years. What do you see as the trajectory of this vast and very complicated country? Well, I think Nigeria is one of those countries that, in a sense, is, if I could invoke some language from the financial crisis, too big to fail. Uh, in other words, as you implied, it's demographically huge, it's strategically and politically of enormous significance to the continent as a whole. So the political stability of not only Nigeria for itself, but for the region, for the continent, is of huge significance. So the type of situation that we've seen, for example, particularly in the last six, seven years, in which one part of the country has been really confronting an insurgency, that's how I see it at least, in the oil producing region, and all of the instabilities that have s surrounded that, both internally, the violence and displacement, how the oil output has fallen, and that's roiled oil markets at a time, as you well know, that uh, um, uh, oil markets are quite sensitive. Um, all of that sort of implies that this stability question is, is really on the front burner. And I think is directly relevant to your question about what the future holds. Um, I would also say that, of course, it's not just the Niger Delta and its relationship to the future of Nigeria that's at stake. But some of your viewers will know that on the front page of the New York Times over the last couple of months has been another insurgency, a different part of the country, the Muslim North, where we've had an Islamist group, Boko Haram, who have destroyed large parts of the northeast and north of the country through sustained attacks uh, and for the first time launched uh, a suicide bombing attack in the capital city in the UN compound. So this question of the future now turns in a sense in part on the fact that the country is confronting these two twin political crises and we've just had some elections uh, this year and I think how those two crises are dealt with will shape profoundly your question about what the future holds. Nigeria's history, of course, is marked by a brutal civil war, 1967 to 1970, when Biafra tried to secede, and also significant periods of military rule. Are those days over? Um, is there, have most Nigerians now a generation after Biafra bought into the idea of Nigeria, mm -hmm. and do you see the military as staying in the barracks, mm -hmm. or are even those questions mm -hmm. still up for grabs? I do think they're still open questions, Jeff. Um, on the one hand, you mentioned Nigeria's achievements, in spite of, frankly, I think we'd have to say, a, a perhaps a very mixed international reputation. Again, if people know anything about Nigeria, it's because of email scams mm -hmm. and corruption mm -hmm. and what have you. On the other hand, you mentioned the Biafran Civil War. And for me, one of the remarkable things about uh, Nigeria, its recent political history, is in the wake of that extraordinary war, with literally millions of casualties, how, in fact, the region slowly and the country was put back together. I think it's a remarkable achievement. Uh, I think one could say that perhaps that was assisted by the fortuitous fact of having a lot of oil and the the ability to use those 
oil revenues to hold the country together. But I don't think one should sell short the political achievement of what that post Biafra policy was able to accomplish. So that's on the one side. Um, you've obviously mentioned the issue of a, a long sustained period of military rule, really, in the wake of the war. And it was only really in 1999, with the return of an ex-military man, Oba Sanjo, that we've had something like sustained sort of civilian rule. Now, um, I think it's fair to say that in general, most Nigerians would tell you that those military days are gone, that they've learned their lesson. Uh, we've now had um, three elections. We can talk about them, how free and fair they were. But most people, I think, would tell you that. On the other hand, um, as you know better than I do, the Nigerian army is the largest standing army in the continent. It's big, powerful, influential. It's never been separate from the big political machinery, the ethnic machinery in that country. And why I raise that is because this year, of course, was a rather extraordinary year in the sense that we had these elections. Um, but on the back of a standing president, Yar Adwa, who died in office, a northerner from a very distinguished and influential Muslim family who died. And there was a period there of incredible mm -hmm. political chaos mm -hmm. where he was out of the country. People didn't know whether he was dead or alive. He mysteriously appeared back in Kano. Um, and uh, no one knew still whether he was dead or alive. And in that chaos, where there was even some debate over the standing vice president should actually be a southerner from the oil-producing region, should actually become president, there was extraordinary chaos. And I have been told um, by people who I think know, told me that there was the very real possibility in that moment of crisis of the military stepping back in. It was very, so I think that incident, as exceptional as it may have been, to me says that the military are simply not out of the picture. As you said, many people know Nigeria because of the email scams, so-called 419 letters named after the relevant section of the Nigerian law. And Nigeria has long been considered by Transparency International and other agencies as amongst the most corrupt countries in the world. Do you see any improvement? In particular, in recent years, there's been a lot of attention given, given to the governor of Lagos State, yep. uh, who has developed an international reputation for good governance, and other initiatives. Or is the overlay of the old corruption still too powerful? I think that the nature of corruption, as endemic as it is, it's sort of structural, as you well know. If it were a question of corrupt federal politicians or ser civil servants dipping into the oil pot, that would be one thing. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's not. It, it has historically sort of settled in the entire system. So going to get a driver's license will involve paying someone as much as it will paying off a, uh, a, a, a speeding ticket. So it's endemic in that sense. But I think the nature of corruption has also changed mm. a little bit in the following sense. I think that one of the impacts of oil, and particularly of the change in the principle by which oil revenues are distributed, there's a complicated, as you know, political mechanism. It's a revenue allocation process. What that has done, it's changing form over time, has meant that greater quantities of money in an admittedly corrupt system are nonetheless reaching the local level and local government areas in particular. And there are almost 800 of them. One of the effects of that is you've had a decentralization of corruption too. And I happen to believe now that some of the most serious uh, levels of corruption are at those local governmental areas. All of that said and done, I think there's some interesting counter-movements which you refer to. One is that there have been efforts um, to invoke some transparency into that revenue allocation process at various levels. One is the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. This really came out of, it was Tony Blair actually, um, where he confronted a rather embarrassing set of situations about BP's practices in Africa and Angola and developed a self-regulatory system mm. where governments and companies could sign up in such a way that there would be a third-party accounting of the 
their practices, including the national oil companies. The Nigerian national oil company is widely seen as being something of a black hole. Um, so one of the effects of that is that there have been some audits, which of course, perhaps no surprise, have shown enormous discrepancies between what the government says it's doing with its money and what it actually is doing. So I think that's an interesting opening. It's provided some space within which more progressive politicians can, I think, make some mileage. It's also trickled down, where there have been some local initiatives, including in the Niger Delta, actually, where you've had non-profit and civic organizations saying, okay, these local governments that are now actually plush with money, they have budgets. Let's make them public. Let's discuss them. And let's have some systems by which they can account for, if they say they're going to build a road, they build a road. It's completed. That's called participatory budgeting. So from above and below, there are the beginnings of trying to prize this system apart. But I think you'd have to say that in, in an economy in which the heart of it is the state being able to capture a bunch of this oil money and distribute it, it's going to be a very, very challenging process to prize that system open. I think it's begun, and I think that beginning is reflected in the fact that after two enormously fraudulent elections, in 2000, 2003 and 2007, characterized incidentally by, I think, a type of political thuggery that we really haven't seen uh, in quite a while in Nigeria, that 2011, everyone I think agrees, was better. Hmm. It sure, it was, if it wasn't free and fair in its entirety, I think all of the election monitors agree that this was a step up from any of the other previous elections. And that stepping up, which is in some sense trying to put in place an electoral commission that was, was not corrupt, and in which was, there was some, uh, some transparency in the process, that to me is an indication. There's a ways to go, we're agreed. But somehow that this, this sort of seemingly unmovable entity, the sort of petro-state in all of its corrupt nature, has at least the beginnings, and perhaps with the election of some new younger senators and Congress people, maybe the beginnings of beginning to be able to shift it in some way. You mentioned the Southeast, the Niger Delta, and here there's a very complicated constellation of is issues, including local grievances about environmental issues, local issues about how the oil money is being spent, ethnic divisions, criminal activity, piracy in that area may actually be higher on a value basis than in the Horn of Africa, as well as a government uh, which exerts, exerts its authority in an incomplete and often brutal nature, and finally, very controversial activities by multinational Correct. corporations, amongst other things. <laughs> Does this get sorted out? Or is this a festering problem for a long period of time? I think you described it brilliantly. And I think you can see when you have that confluence of forces, big government, big oil, criminal activities, um, militias, ethnic complexity overlaid upon an already corrupt system that we've talked about, that also makes for what I've called a, an oil complex that's in some sense also very difficult to pull apart and produces all manner of internal tensions that are difficult to deal with. All of that said, I think there are some things which at least if are not bright lights would give me a little bit of optimism. One is standing at the center of that crisis right now is again an insurgency. Between 2005 when a group called the Movement for the Emancipation of the Niger Delta who no no one knew really anything about, swept onto the political stage through to 2009, it essentially successfully, as it said it would, closed down the oil industry from 2.6 million barrels a day to at its low point in 2009, barely 800,000 barrels. That's a big piece of this. Um, and resolving that, in addition to the other things, it seems to me has to be a, um, a central and primary concern. To that extent, the fact that the president is indeed a Delta man, first president from that region, understands full well the nature of the, the dynamics there, and interestingly has surrounded himself 
with some younger advisors who actually were the product of that movement, of that politicization of the Niger Delta, leads me to believe that, in fact, he's now got a cadre there that, in fact, are capable of moving this forward. And I think that they, the fact that there was an amnesty declared, 20,000 militants took that amnesty. There is a post-amnesty rehabilitation program. We can argue about it's, it's come off the rails a couple of times, I agreed. But the fact is that that must represent, I think, um, an avenue along which the government clearly wants to proceed. So that's one issue. Um, secondly, I do think that some of these other issues, you mentioned piracy, you mentioned the explicitly sort of criminal activities here. I mean, on the one hand, most insurgencies, as I understand it, this is an area you've written about yourself, Steve, um, uh, Jeff, is, is, is the fact that there's a, there's a mix of forces in all insurgencies that are licit and illicit, criminal and non-criminal. And it's hard to separate them. One person's criminality is another person's mm -hmm. social justice. And I don't mean to downplay the, the significance and scale of things like oil theft and piracy, but these issues are entangled in complicated types of ways. And I think that what I would say here is that I do think that there's a possibility now, again with a president who understands the situation, of at least trying to address that. And for me, the heart of that problem is an employment problem. These, I think what we have to recognize is a part of that criminal activity without glorifying it, without making it, reading into it a politics that isn't there, is, is not inseparable from the fact that this is a region that has been neglected. Youth unemployment is probably somewhere around the order of 60 to 70 percent. This is a generation who in some sense feel that their future, perhaps not unlike those young men and women that were in the streets in Cairo, see their future, often many of whom, incidentally, have high school educations, have college education. Let me remind you that some of the leadership in these militias are in fact college educated mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. This is not a lumpen mo movement. So the un their prospects seem truncated. And I th believe then that addressing simultaneously the employment question and figure out how that can be can address some of the concerns of people who are currently feel that criminal activities is a better career life career trajectory um, is a central part of again lowering the temperature on what is a very very tricky and sort of complex set of problems. You mentioned also the new insurgency in the north uh, or at least new terrorism but you've also written over many years about a variety of Islamic movements in the north, government's brutal response to them. Is this something new? Is it a continuation and internationalization of the previous disputes? How do you understand it? And how much of a threat do you think it poses to the Nigerian state? Mm. I think it's old and new, Jeff. Old in the sense that for a century and more, there have always been important internal debates within the Muslim community in the North over what constitutes a proper m Muslim discourse and set of practices. That sometimes took the form of differences of opinion between the brotherhoods. It sometimes took the form of differences of opinion between the brotherhoods and certain modernizing elements the Anizala movement, for example, within the North. So there have always been these sorts of very serious debates in the context of the North being not just Muslim, but the center of political power in the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that has a deep history. And occasionally, throughout that deep history, we've had eruptions of what we could call um, Muslim militancy. Um, most dramatically, in the 1980s, a group called Maitatsini emerged in Kano, who had a, one could argue, very unorthodox interpretation of the hadith, of the Quran, of what constituted um, uh, um, Muslim practice. But it was very much rooted, incidentally, in similar processes as we just described in the Niger Delta. A class of individuals, urban youth, essentially marginalized outside of 
any of the benefits of the oil wealth who were attracted by this particular anti-Western, anti-modernist discourse. It was repressed, even though, by the military, even though it had, it resonated with certain sections of, not, not the militancy, but the sense that, that, as they said, that the moral project of Muslim leadership in the North had been corrupted. That was the heart of it. Whatever its idiosyncrasies. Well, Boko Haram, which really means anti-Western education, which emerged in the last couple of years, in that sense, is a part of that continuity. Mm -hmm. And I think it has to be taken very seriously as not just an attempt to restore the caliphate. It has restorational type qualities to go back, as it were, in some way. But I think it has to be seen, seen in what that movement is saying about current leadership in the country and the decay, as they see it, within the sort of political moral community. Now, what's new about it? Well, what's new about it is it appears, this is uh, still a, an issue about, about which there's some difference of opinion, but my own view is that there is evidence to suggest that it has connections with uh, AQIM, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb. It's pretty clear, and the evidence I think is quite clear now, that some of the bombings show all the telltale signs of having connections with that group. That's new. That's different. That's a post-September 11 type of phenomena. It's wrapped up with the war on terror. It's wrapped up with the shifting frontiers of a certain type of radical Islamism, of which Al-Qaeda is one expression, extending its frontier into the West African Sahel. So that is very different and, of course, is very worrying and very troubling. So when you put the old and the new together in relationship to your question, is this a threat to Nigeria? I think it absolutely is. Not just because of the Al Qaeda, potential Al Qaeda connection, but because this, after all, is a challenge to the very political core of the country. This is, after all, the Muslim North, which is talking about a radical moral decay and abandonment of the very principles of Sharia, in their case, um, and more widely of the entire political leadership mm -hmm. and of their exclusion from a type of secular national project. They're offering not a secular project, of course, but a religious alternative. So I think it's impossible, uh, and it's a long answer to your question, but I think it's, it's impossible to underestimate the significance of what this movement represents. Final question, although we could discuss Nigeria, of course, for a long time. The Nigerian diaspora in Europe, in the UK, in the United States is becoming more significant, more prominent. There are many Nigerian Americans, of course, who are reaching significant right. positions in business, politics, and the like. What does the rise of this diaspora mean for Nigeria and for our U.S. long-term relations with Nigeria? I think it's a complicated issue uh, for the following reason. I mean, on the one hand, one way to see that diaspora, of course, is a type of brain drain. Uh, my campus has just hired a couple of brilliant young Nigerian scientists. One would like to think, and I'm sure Nigerians, the Nigerian government would love to think, that they would be at the University of Ibadan in Suka, uh, Amadebelo University. So sometimes the fact that the energies, and I've never met anyone who's vi visited Nigeria who hasn't said that here is a country of enormous entrepreneurial and intellectual energy, that parts of those energies are in some sense being channeled elsewhere, and that in some sense is a type of loss. I know the, Ni the Nigerian government has and is attempting to rebrand itself uh, through the media in a way that I think it's not only related to the 419 scams and all of that, but trying to present itself as a plausible al alternative to precisely that class of professionals that we're just talking about. So there's that side of things. On the other hand, the fact that there are these diasporic communities around the world, um, including, as you know well now, uh, South Africa, a very dynamic Nigerian sub-economy within South Africa that these sorts of diaspora communities then become important in and of themselves. And I think 
are, among other things, repatriating capital and remittances. We know there's a huge remittance economy that's not insignificant. Um, they typically retain all sorts of connections to the country, and they become politically significant in the US, in South Africa, in the UK. And I think they have become, in a way that's relatively new, sort of um, important lobbying voices within UK-Nigeria relations, US-Nigeria uh, relations. So I think that's important. The last thing I would say is, of course, that typically these sorts of diasporas um, can themselves have rather different types of roles. I remember hearing a, a lecture once by Ben Anderson, uh, who of course has written powerfully about nationalism. He made the point that, you know, one of the things about these diaspora communities is that they can be in the business of what he called fax nationalism. They can, they can, those Ijo, Ibo communities in Johannesburg in San Francisco can be in the business, in fact, of promoting their political community. And I say that because um, that's, there can be both positive and negative aspects to that. And so one of the negative aspects, it seems to me, is we know in the case of the Niger Delta that to the extent that one of the communities that's been central in those movements, the Ijo ethnic group, it's clear that some of the arms that they were getting were through the diaspora mm -hmm. community, mm -hmm. in this case, mm -hmm. South Africa. So again, I, I'm trying to paint a, a complicated picture of on the one hand, there is this global presence of the Nigerian diaspora, which is very, very positive. It's partly perhaps a reflection uh, of the limited opportunities that have historically been in the country. Um, the, the Nigerian government is obviously concerned to try to bring those home in some way. Uh, at the same time that those diaspora communities are, are increasingly politically active in ways that don't necessarily translate into a set of presences in the country that make it any easier for President Goodluck Jonathan. Excellent. Michael, thank you so much. Thank you for visiting with us. Thank you very much, Dick.